title of my sermon today is The Purpose of Life. The Purpose of Life. And the reason why I'm preaching on this sermon is uh, preaching this sermon today is because this is the start, obviously, of uh, you know, a new uh, era for our church, you know, we're moving over to Moorbank, a change of name. But also being the first Sunday of the year, often in January, people are making New Year's resolutions, aren't they? And they're thinking about what they want to accomplish, what they accomplished in the last year. Hopefully you had a fruitful year last year and what you're going to accomplish in the new year. And I think it's always important when we decide how we're going to live our life, we need to be reminded why we are even living our life to begin with and have the right perspective when we make New Year's resolutions and think about and hey, why am I even here? And sometimes we get so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, the rat race, you know, just the, the daily grind that we don't stop to think about why are we even here? Why do we exist? What is the purpose of my life? And a lot of people go through life not even thinking about this question or maybe they think about it, they don't find the right answer and it leads them to depression. But today, I'm going to talk about things that people live for, what they make the purpose of their life, and obviously what should be the purpose of our life, to get you to think about what is the purpose of your life? Why does God have us here? Why do we exist? What is the reason for our existence? And this is something that every religion attempts to answer, to give people a purpose. And, you know, the atheists will mock and say people use, you know, religion as a crutch to give people a purpose. But you know what's ironic about the atheists is they believe life has a purpose too. I remember when I was going to public school, one, and, you know, when I was taught in science class about the purpose of life, you know what I was told? That it's all about reproduction. That, that's, what the, that's what the atheist professor taught me in science class. It's all about reproduction. And it shows, as he preached atheism to the class, that that's how he described why you do everything in life. Because that was the purpose to an atheist, to just keep the human species alive. So he was saying, well, why do you have legs? Well, you have legs so that you can walk, so that you can work, so that you can reproduce to keep the human species alive. So it's funny that even a, a mentality that has no God, that seemingly teaches no purpose, they do have a purpose. They think your purpose is simply reproduction. And he, you know, what's so, what's so demoralizing about atheism is he likened human beings to like a flower. He said, he said a flower, if you think about a flower, everything about a flower is about getting a, a bee to come and pollinate it. So, you know, why is it pretty? It's pretty so that it can attract the bee, why is there a stem to put it high enough so that the bee will come and pollinate? And, and the purpose of that flower is just to pollinate, you know, and just to, you know, just to, just to reproduce physically. And he said, hey, that's just our purpose. We just reproduce and then our purpose is over, we're gone. You know, but now there's a, there's a spiritual truth to that. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So this is a question, the purpose of life. Why are we here? That's what I want you to think about today. Why is this church here? Why do you exist? Why doesn't God just take you home the moment you get saved? Well, it's because he has a purpose for us. He has a reason for us to exist and he has works for us to do. There is a reason for our life. And, you know, when you decide why you live your life, that will change how you live your life. So that's why it's so important that you internalize why you exist, the purpose of your life, why you are living, because when you decide the right reason, and you know, if you even decide the wrong reason why you live your life, that's going to change how you live your life. So this is why it's important. You know, Jesus said here, in Matthew 6, we just read this chapter. He said, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
So when people decide on a purpose for their life, that's something they're passionate about. That's where their treasure is. And Jesus is saying, whatever you value, what your, where your treasure is, that's what you're going to love too. That's what you're going to think about. That's where your heart is going to be. And that's why it's so important that you have the right why in your life so that your heart is in the right place. You have the right, you know, how in your life. Now, I remember, you know, when you, when you listen to a lot of success seminars, you know, people, you know, and you have, to, you have to really be careful and have some discernment when you listen to success seminars because a lot of it is very humanistic. You know, it's very, you need to believe in yourself if you just do it as opposed to trusting God. But one piece of advice I thought was very interesting and, and I think was a good piece of advice is about when you're setting, your, you know, how you're going to live your life, one thing I've heard is you ought to live it backwards. Who's ever heard that before? You know, when you live your life backwards. What do I mean by that? Is that you start with where you want to end up and then you think about how you're going to live that life so that you reach that end point that you've decided on. You know, a lot of this teaching comes when you, when you think about success seminars, talk about goal setting. You know, goal setting, you want to think about where you want to end up, where your goal is, and then you work out the steps, how you're going to live your life to accomplish that goal. And this is why it's so important that you think about the purpose of your life. What do you want your life to be about? Where is it going to end up? And then you live your life backwards. You consider where you end and then think about how it needs to be lived to accomplish that end. Now, I'm going to come back to that, but I want to go through today five things, and we're going to look at some scriptures related to that. Five things that people make the purpose of their life. And when they do, you know, they're in sin. They're making an idol. They have got the wrong purpose in their life. Now, not, these things are not wrong in and of themselves. But when they become the purpose of your life, that's when you're in sin. But let's have a look. Let's have a look at five, five things, four things. And then obviously the last one, you know what I'm going to. But let's look at these. We're going to be reminded today. Number one, what's one thing that people live for? Purpose of their life. One thing is pleasure. What do I mean by pleasure? It's the gadgets. It's the relaxation. Working so hard so that you can retire and relax and just enjoy life. You know, working so hard so that you can go on that holiday, enjoy that nice trip, go try that food here and there. Now, like I said, these things are not wrong in and of themselves. There is a time for rest, what they call R&R, &R, right? Rest and relaxation, to refresh and to relax. But if the purpose of your life is just for pleasure, you know, for fun, going and experiencing maybe music and all these different things, these holidays, if that's why you live, you have the wrong purpose for your life. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 2. Solomon, King Solomon is such a great example when it comes to pleasures of this life. Why? Because he indulged in it all. If you know the story of King Solomon, you know, not only did he have it all, he had all the money, he had all the power. What's interesting is he also had all the wisdom. So foolishly, he went through all this and it became an example in the Bible of somebody that just indulged in a hedonistic lifestyle. But what's interesting is because he had the wisdom of God, he could reflect on it and we have the teaching today to be an example for us, a reminder for us that these things are vanity and vexation of spirit. Let's go from Ecclesiastes 2. And King Solomon, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he, he says here, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, look at this, enjoy pleasure. That's what we're talking about. Pleasure, people living for pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. So he's saying he, he went about to go and prove pleasure and see if there was any profit in living a life just for pleasure. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? So these are his conclusions at the beginning. Now in verse 3, he goes into what he did. And when you read about some of the things he did, 
And you read even in the stories in Kings and in Chronicles of what Solomon did. He's famous for what? Having a thousand women in his life. 300 wives, 700 concubines. Now, sexual sin is a sin that m many men struggle with. And this is one he indulged in too. So these, we, he has covered all bases. Verse 3. I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine. So there's your, the people that go out for drugs and drunkenness and things like that. Yet acquainting my heart with wisdom. So you see how he's going out and he's indulging in these things, but he also has the wisdom of God to reflect on it, to give us some wise words here in Ecclesiastes. And to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under heaven all the days of their lives. So you see he's saying he's going to go and enjoy all this pleasure and see if there's any good in it. If there's, any, if there's any profit in it at all. I made me great works. I builded me houses. So think about your property developer. You know, some people, that's what their life is about. Just building up investments, building up property, building up this kingdom. And that's their purpose of life. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and or orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. So he's got businesses going. He's got beautiful gardens. I made me pools of water to water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees. So if you think he, he made a botanic garden to enjoy nature. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Such a luxurious lifestyle. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasures of kings and of the provinces. So what he's collecting antiques. You know, he's, he's a collector. You know, some people, their life is about getting those, you know, uh, I, I look into like those numismatic coins and some people just live their life either collecting coins or collecting watches. Yeah, they'll travel all over the world to get that fancy clock that nobody has, but they won't even walk across the street and go knock on a door and preach the gospel. This shows people where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, because what you're willing to do for something all over the world, do all these hours of research, and yet you don't even do that for the Lord Jesus Christ, that's telling you where your heart is, because that's where your treasure is. It says, I gathered me also silver and gold, peculiar treasures of kings and of provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men. As musical instruments and that of all sorts, and so he's going to concerts. You know, he's listening to a lot of music. You know, some people, that's what they live for. They just want to go and just, just hear the music and just enjoy life. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me. And look at this. I've underlined this. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. So you see how Solomon's got it all covered. So you may be thinking when you read Solomon's story, yeah, but Solomon didn't get to enjoy the things we get to enjoy today. Maybe if he enjoyed the things today, he'd have a different story. No, Solomon had it all. He enjoyed it all. He knew what it meant to experience every joy, traveling, food, women, the drugs, you know, the good and the bad. He went and experienced it all. Whatever he saw, he, want, and he wanted it, he got it. I rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion for all my labor. Then I looked on all the works. This is his conclusion. That my hands had wrought, and then on the labor that I'd labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. What does it mean to be vanity and vexation of spirit? It means it's tough. It was a hard slog. And then he realized, says here, and there was no profit under the sun. Now, if the wisest man that ever lived, that indulged in every pleasure imaginable, came to the conclusion that this was all vanity and vexation of spirit, what about you? You know, when you think of your own life, if you are living for pleasure, are you wiser than the wisest man that ever lived? No. You know, we don't want to live for pleasure. What's number two? Number two is some people, they make the purpose of their life work. Now, whether that's a hobby 
or whether that's your career as an employee, or whether that's a business. You know, people want to establish themselves. Sometimes it's not always about the money, is it? Sometimes it's just about accomplishing something. You feel like you want to be accomplished in this life. You want to build up a kingdom in this life. You want to build up something of worth in this life, a business, a reputation. And people make this the purpose of their life. Now, just a reminder, I'm not saying these things are bad. You know, people got to work. People got to relax. People have to do these things. What I'm talking about is, is this the purpose of your life? Is this why you're here? Or is why you're here something, a greater purpose? Because if you make these things the purpose of your life, you're in sin. But there's nothing wrong with having some of these things in your life. Obviously, people got to work. But unfortunately, some people make work their purpose and they're in error. Let's continue. We'll just keep reading. It's funny, in Ecclesiastes 2, not only does he talk about indulging in every pleasure, but Solomon also talks about the things that he accomplished in his life. You think about what, 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 uh, what legacy he's leaving for the next generation. And sometimes people think about that when they think about their role in a corporation or they think about their business that they're building. Hey, what change can they affect in the world? And they're only thinking about this world. They're only thinking about the change they affect here. And this is what Solomon has to say about it. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man, what can the man do that cometh after the king? Even that which had been already done. See, people go out to accomplish great things. But everything's already been done. You know, there's not, the Bible says nothing new is under the sun. You just say, yeah, well, you know, we don't have, we don't have technology now. But you know, they had communication in the past. I mean, communication still happens. I mean, communication might be a bit more efficient, but you know, there's still communication in the past and the ways people get messaging around and communication. So he's saying, hey, people have built businesses in the past. You know, people have created wealth in the past. People have built up their reputation. There's nothing new in the sense what people were trying to accomplish in the past, they're trying to accomplish now. Yeah, things may be a bit different. There may be new gadgets and technology and discoveries, but, you know, People have always been inventing things. People have always been creating things. People have always been building businesses and doing that. That's what I believe he's talking about here. Even that which has been already done. Look at this. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. What is he saying here? When he went to look out into the wisdom of the world, he's saying, hey, there's a huge difference between wisdom and people that are foolish. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's so, wisdom and folly are so far apart, it's like light and darkness. That's what he's saying. He says, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. So what is he saying here? Wise men know what's going on, but foolish people don't. They walk in darkness, they just live in life. They're not thinking about things. But then he says here, and I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. And as we read through this chapter, we start to learn what he's talking about. What is that one event that happens to the wise or the foolish? Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? So what is he talking about? If he's just living for this life to accomplish something in this life, he's saying, hey, there is a huge difference between somebody who's an idiot and somebody who's really smart. But he says, ultimately, if this life is all there is, one thing happens to both of us. And then what does it even matter how wise I was? What does it even matter what I accomplished? Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the first, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. Look at this in verse 16. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. So in this life, he's saying, hey, if this life is all there is and you accomplish something great in this life only, he's saying forever it's going to be forgotten. So whether you were the smartest man alive or whether you were the dumbest man alive, in terms of eternity, it's going to be forgotten. 
That's why he's saying it's vain. It's vain to work for something that is not going to last. And ultimately, everything that we see in this world is not going to last. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten, and how dieth the wise man as the fool. So now you know what event he's talking about that happens to everyone. He's saying, if you're smart or if you're dumb, it doesn't matter because ultimately you will die whether you're wise or you're dumb and eventually your great works will be forgotten in terms of works in this life. Verse 17, Therefore I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. What is he saying? He says, you take the fact to be wise and to work hard just in this life. He's saying he hated life because it's hard work. And if it's just all forgotten, what was the point of it all? Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it. See, because you can't take all the physical stuff you work for in this life into the next world. Because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool. Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. You see what he's saying here? You work so hard, and this happens in family businesses. You know, if you don't raise your children right, a lot of family businesses, they work and they sweat to build that legacy, and then they hand it over to their lazy son, and it just gets ruined. This is what, this is what Solomon's talking about. She handed, he handed it over, he's like, who knows whether this guy's going to be wise or an idiot? I just squander everything I work for, and even when he thought about that, I'm just thinking, what is the point of my life if my business is what I'm living for, if my work, my career is what I'm living for. You know, a CEO can do it too. Build up a company, quits the company, the next CEO comes in, an idiot, just makes the company tank. You know, this is what he's talking about. So like I said, work is not in and of itself bad, but are you making work the purpose of your life? Is that where your heart is? Is that what you think about all the time? Is that what you're stressing about all the time? Do you go out of your way for your business, for your work, you know, making things happen? You know, and I get that we have to make an income. I'm not, I'm not down on that. But I'm saying, is that all it's about? Is that all your life is about? That's what I want you guys to think about. Number three is wealth. This is an obvious one. Because why do people work? Because they want to make money. Some people, they have enough money to enjoy life, for the pleasure, but that's not enough for them. And some people make a love of money and the accumulation of wealth the purpose of their life. Where they just work, the, what they live and they breathe for is just accumulate more and more and more. And they think one day they're going to be satisfied. But you know, he that is satisfied with, with silver shall not be satisfied with silver. So wealth is not why we should live. Let's go to Luke 12. And I want to read a passage from Luke 12, which is very familiar if you've read your Bible, and it talks about the rich fool. The rich fool. Let's look at what the rich fool did. This is a parable from Jesus Christ. And Jesus says here, and he said unto them, take heed. What does that mean, to take heed? It means to pipe up, listen to what's going on, and take heed and internalize this. Don't just listen to this passage and brush it off this is Jesus Christ now in the flesh preaching what we're about to read here. And he's saying, take heed. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Now this applies especially to us in Australia in 2019 because we live a very prosperous life. And if you don't take heed to your life, you need to beware of covetousness because it's so easy to be covetous, especially in 2019 where there's so much to be covetous about. Where advertisements are just bombarded to you, right? Through Google ads and Facebook, they're tracking your movements, they want to see so they can sell your stuff. Right? If you have a covetous heart, you'll have plenty of things to spend your money on. Is there, you guys ever run out of things to spend your money on? There's always things to spend your money on. You think, you know, I've got everything I need, but I could, I could think of things to spend my money on. Yeah? Take heed and beware of covetous, covetousness. Look at this, from man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. What is Jesus saying here? Your life is not about wealth. 
the purpose of why you're here, why you live, why you live and breathe, and God has you here, is not about wealth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a rich, a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. So he's, he's a farmer, right? And he's just got plenty of crop. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He's saying, hey, I've run out of room to keep all my crop. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So he's run out of space to bestow all his wealth. And he said, what is he going to do? Well, I'm going to spend more time pulling down my barns. I'm sure it takes a lot of time to pull them down, to build them up. You know, maybe back in those days it took a lot shorter because today now you've got to deal with the council and all the regulations and, and all, you know, all, that, all the costs. And it's probably so much more. Here, you know, you can probably just grab a few mates and just get a tractor and pull it down and, you know, build it up. But it still takes labor. It still like, takes time. This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Look at this. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Right? So he wants to build it all up so that he can what? Retire. Relax. But God said unto him, Thou fool. That's the Bible way of saying, you idiot. Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. What is he saying? In this, in this parable, God said, hey, you just built up this, you just built up all this wealth, and God is saying, it's time for you to come home. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? He's saying, so now, now who's going to have all your stuff? that you work so hard for. And this is what I want you guys to focus on in this passage here in Luke. The Bible says here, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. What the Bible's saying here is, if you think your life is just about the abundance of the things you possess and you just live to make money and to make wealth and you never have enough, you just want to accumulate more stocks, more gold and silver, more property, you just want your business to make more money, you just want to be more prosperous so you can boast about how much you have and you can show people how successful you are and that's what your life is about, the Bible says, thou fool. Yep. You idiot. That you live your life this way and you've made the purpose of your life wealth. So is he, so in what way, thou fool, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the fourth one I want to talk about. And I just want to remind you guys again, I'm not against any of these things that I'm talking about. It's when these things become the purpose of our life that they become sin. When they take a higher priority than God. And the last one I want to talk about is family. And you might think, family? Family is the most important thing in the world. If you have that, you have that mentality, you're wrong. Family is not the most important thing. And family is not the purpose of why we live. And you know what's interesting? If we want to know how we ought to think of family, our physical family, and I'm not saying we don't value our family, don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying family is not important. I'm just saying it's not the purpose of why you live. And some people make it about their purpose. Either it's keeping up with family's expectations. Or maybe it's, you know, people get married and they're just so, you know, what's the word? Like just so infatuated with their partner. That's all, that's what they live for. You know, they just want to do every, whatever this person does. You know, not thinking about God at all. Some people, once they have children, that's what they make their life about. Do everything for their children. Want to have, make, make their children comfortable. Sometimes that's a detriment to your children when you give them too much. You know, our children, they need to grow up, they need to learn to work. 
They need to learn the value of money. Don't just let your kids grow up, give them everything, do everything for them. Get them to help clean around the house. Get them to pick up their own rubbish. You know, get them to do chores. Get them to earn their money. Don't, you know, as soon as they, you know, get their license, just buy them a $40,000 car. That's crazy. You know, I mean, people just have it too easy in this life. And these are the type of spoiled brats that grow up and they have no sense of value for money. So people live for their children, don't they? They live for their family. Now, if there was a... I think these turn off. If there was an example in the Bible of how Jesus treated his family... Don't you, don't you think we should take heed to that? You think, well, man, fa family is just so important. And I agree with you, it is so important. But if I make it the purpose of my life and I think I'm justified in that, let's look at what Jesus did. We're going to look at some examples of how Jesus thought about his family. Right? Mark 3. The Bible says here, verse 31, Then came then his brethren and his mothers, and standing without sent unto him, calling him. So what's happening here in Mark 3? Jesus is preaching to a crowd and his family is saying he's calling him to go and speak with him. And the multitude, his physical family, right? Mary and his half-brothers and sisters. And the multitude sat about him and they said unto him, Behold, so they kind of interrupt Jesus, right? He's, he's preaching. He says, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them saying, Look at this. Who is my mother? Or my brethren. Now just think about that for a bit. While I turn these air conditioners on and off so that they go back to cold. Because these air conditioners, they... I think they cycle between hot and cold, so... He says, who is my mother or my brethren? Now, if you're not familiar with this passage, you're probably thinking, if you didn't know that was Jesus talking, you're probably thinking, what a disrespectful brat. If you have the wrong perspective and you don't realize this is Jesus teaching us how we're meant to think of our families, he says, hey, his family's calling him without. And he's like, who's my mother? Who's my brethren? And he looked round about on them, which sat about him, the people he's preaching to. And he said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. So this is a hard pill to swallow. But what the Bible, what Jesus is teaching us here is our spiritual family is actually more important than our physical family. Now, I'm not saying our physical family is not important. Don't get me wrong. It's not that one's not important and one's important. It's that... Physical family is important, but guess what's even more important? Jesus Christ's family. That's what's more important. So he looked round about on them and which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Look at this. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Now, I didn't write that. That's a hard pill. You know, maybe for in my life, you know, honestly, in my life, my, I come from a broken family. You know, my family is not that close. A lot of my family don't even speak English, you know, like my extended family. So <laughs> I can't even communicate with them. So, you know, for me, this is a bit of an easier pill to swallow because, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always had my, my closest friends. And then when I was in church, my closest friends were in church. But for those of you who have families that are from a Christian background, you're very close, you need to remember this that you, we don't hold your family higher than the family of God. Like Jesus did here. Look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 10. This is the second passage I want to show you about Jesus teaching about family. And we're talking about, do we make family the purpose of our life? Matthew 10, verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. So Jesus is saying here, hey, he didn't come to just get everyone to get along you know, he doesn't, Jesus is not peace through compromise. Jesus is peace through the truth. Amen. This is the sword because he's the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. 
So he's saying here, he didn't come to send peace on earth. He came to bring division, a sword. See, a sword divides. And that's what the truth does sometimes. And he's saying here that truth can even divide families. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And look at this, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. You know, sometimes the truth is going to cause some division in families, unfortunately. You know, I'm not saying we want to do it intentionally, but sometimes you need to take a stand. If you take a stand in your family for the Word of God and for the truth, sometimes people are going to get upset. And that's going to be a test for you if you ever find yourself in that situation, what the purpose of your life is. Because let me tell you what, if you bow down to your family's desires over the Word of God, you just prove to yourself that the purpose of your life is family. That's where your treasure is, because that's where your heart is. But if you take a stand and you say, you know what, I'm going to stand up for the Word of God, I'm going to stand up for Jesus Christ, even if my family persecute me, then you've got the right perspective. He that loveth father or mother more than me. So you see, so it's in comparison to Jesus. It's not that he wants us to hate our families. He wants us to love our families. But is it that you love your family more than Jesus? You know, so when he says you hate father or mother, it's in comparison to serving Jesus. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth, loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So are you living for your family? You know, is that the purpose of your life? You know, family is not a bad thing, but that's not why we live. Now the last thing, and this is obvious, what should our life be about? It should be about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're here for. We're here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. If God didn't want you to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the day you got saved, you would be taken from this earth. He would be done with you. The fact that you are still alive after salvation means that God is not done with you. Right? He can use you and he has works which before the world was ordained for you to do that you should walk in them. And if you do not make Jesus the purpose of your life, if you don't make the work of God the purpose of your life, you are missing the purpose of your life. And you're in error. You're in sin. If Jesus is not the reason why you're living, you've got the wrong reason. I want to read from Ecclesiastes 12. There's a passage here that just reminds us we're going back to Solomon now. And chapter 12 in Ecclesiastes, this is the conclusion of Solomon's findings after he goes and seeks out wisdom, he tries all the pleasure, and this is his conclusion now why we ought to be living. It says here in Ecclesiastes 12, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Remember now th thy Creator in the days of your youth. Now even if you're in later generations, just take the first part of the verse. Remember now thy Creator. Not remember next week. Not remember next year. Not remember when you've got everything in order. Not remember your Creator when you've done all that you want to do and now you've got some spare time to give to God. No, the Bible says, remember now thy Creator. In the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. What is he saying? Because one day you're going to get old. And you're not going to be able to serve God the way you could when you were young and you were strong. While the, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. So now he goes into a beautiful analogy of life ending. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. And the strong men, your legs, shall bow themselves. It may be your legs. It could be your back, actually, because when people get older, they start to arch over, right? The strong men. You think about a strong man is up and upright. 
He's saying that there will be a day when the strong men start to get tired, right? And bow themselves. And the grinders cease because they are few. You know, teeth start to fall. Those that look out of the windows be darkened. I'm starting to feel that too. You know, when you start losing sight. That's what this is talking about. Those that look out of the windows. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. What is that saying? It's saying when you are, get older, you start to go to sleep earlier. You have less time. And you shall rise up at the voice of the bird. You struggle to sleep. A lot of older people struggle to sleep. They get up early. Right? But they don't have energy. Go to sleep early. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. What is that saying? You're starting to struggle hearing. And when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way. See, when you start to get older, you start to take less risks, don't you? You start to be fearful of making mistakes. Whereas when you're young, think about it as a young, young Christians, they're just zealous, they just go. Older Christians start to take less risks, start to get a bit watered down. It's the same in our physical life too. He's saying here, you won't be as zealous for God. You'll be more worried about what people think when you're older. Not when you're younger though. And fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail. I'm not sure what all these talk about. Some people think the almond tree is the white hair. You know, and the almond tree flourishes, it's white. The grasshopper shall be a burden. I hope that's not him talking about his wife. But, uh, you know, I don't know what the grasshopper is. You know, maybe, I, I have a feeling it's like going to the toilet, maybe. It's hard to go to the toilet. Desire shall fail, that sexual desire. Because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets. What's that? That's talking about when you die. You go home and people are mourning your death. Or ever the silver cord be loosed. What's that talking about? Your back, your spinal cord. Or the golden bowl be broken. That's when people get Alzheimer's, right? They lose their mind. Or the pitcher be broken at the fountain. So this, you know, maybe this is your, you know, your system doesn't work anymore to go to the toilet and whatnot. And the wheel broken at the cistern. I think that's talking about your heart. You start to have heart failure. Right? And, the, and the, 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 the cistern isn't, the wheel isn't spinning right anymore as it creates, it pumps water. Blood in the instance. Verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. So this is Solomon now writing out these proverbs, what he's learned. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. He's saying if you take heed to wise words, it's going to direct your life in the right way. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Look at this. For this is the whole duty of man. That's your purpose. To serve the Lord Jesus Christ. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. Romans 12, we talked about this. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. See, it's not about you anymore. Your whole duty is to be a sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ, a living sacrifice where you give up your will, your desires, your purpose for your life, and the purpose of your life is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just because God wants to oppress you, it's because that's all that matters. Because if you make your life about serving money, about serving family, about serving pleasure, it's vanity and vexation of spirit. God doesn't want that for you. That's why the whole duty of man is to serve God, to keep his commandments and to fear God. Because Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiastes Solomon realized this is all that matters. After all is said and done, after all is experienced, after all is enjoyed, after you've accomplished all you can accomplish in this life, he says, 
It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. The purpose of my life is to serve God. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? Because God has given you so much. He came, He died for you, He rose again. And this is what compels us to serve Him. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I'm, I'm coming to an end here. I just want to share a few more passages with you. But just to go back to the beginning of what we talked about, which was the good advice, where we look to the end, what the purpose of our life is, and then we ought to decide how we live our life. Now, I think that's good advice, but the problem where people apply this advice to their life is that they don't look far enough into the future. Because if you only look to this life, you're going to make the wrong choices in how you live your life. But God wants us to see beyond this life into eternity. Realize what you're going to have in eternity and the purpose of what you're, what you're working for in eternity. Then you think about how you're going to live your life and how you're going to fit pleasure, work, family, you know, these things into your life to accomplish the greater purpose, which is eternity, serving God, bringing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, if you missed the sermon last week, too bad, because it didn't get recorded. But I want to repeat this point again on this verse, because I think it's so important, that if we're going to decide how we're going to live our life, we need to look far enough into the future, and far enough into the future is eternity. That's where we want to look, at the things which are not seen. Now, the things which are seen are temporal. That's a profound thought, that everything you see with your eyes will one day be gone. Take a look around, guys. Your car, your boats, your bikes, your, your house, your business, your job, all that stuff will one day be gone. It's temporal. And there's only one, one way to make the people you know eternal, and that's to get them saved. So what I like to tell people I sometimes tell people about this when we go door knocking and we tell them, you know, you don't want to waste your life. Yeah, you're saved now, but don't waste your life just living for yourself. And we'll ask them this question. I'll say, what is the one thing you can take to heaven besides yourself? Obviously, when you're saved, you take yourself to heaven. But you're thinking about what's the one thing that's not seen in this life that you can take to heaven with you you can't take your property, your wealth, your house, you know, the only thing you can take in the next life are other people by getting them saved. That's the only thing you can take into, this, into the next life. And that's why our life needs to be about winning souls to Jesus Christ. That's why this afternoon, you know, I'm not just going to go home and relax, say, man, I've had a hard day. You know, some people, they, they come to church, they sit in church, listen to a sermon, they're like, whoa, what a hard morning. You have, no, you have no idea. It's easy to sit in church and listen to a sermon. It's easy to eat. That's like going to a restaurant and eating and saying, oh, man, what a hard night. You know, work so hard. That's why this afternoon, this afternoon, I'm not going to go home and relax. This afternoon, we're going to go out, we're going to fulfill our purpose, we're going to go out and preach the gospel to the people here, we're going to knock on those doors, Make sure we go soul winning every week. Why? Because that's the one thing we can take into the next life. And that's what my life should be about. It's about winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can take more souls to heaven. I want to finish this sermon just by reading this last passage in Philippians 3. As we think about what we're going to do in the next year, hopefully you guys think about the year that's gone past. When I read that passage in Ecclesiastes 12, I just think how fast life has gone. Every year I'm reminded, and I'm sure it's the same for you, every year I'm reminded how quick life is going. Man, the year is over already. 
And you need to think about what did you accomplish? And if you didn't accomplish anything for God, shame on you. Because your purpose ought not be about the things of this life. Your purpose should be about heavenly things, the things that are not seen. Having an eternal perspective, looking all the way into eternity, living your life backwards and thinking, okay, how am I going to live my life to make sure I'm laying up treasures in heaven, not on earth? And maybe you didn't have a great year spiritually. And that's why I want to read this passage to sort of set the mindset as we move forward as the church in Liverpool, as we go soul winning this area and we renew our purpose as a church in our personal life and get fired up about the things of God. Look at what Paul writes here. He says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He talks about his accomplishments in life and how he's a Jew and he's got all this training and everything. All, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, you see the purpose of Paul's life? He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I make apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. And that's my prayer for you guys today, that God would get a hold of your heart, you would think about why you live your life, how you live your life, and I pray, God, that this passage that Paul writes here, that that would be revealed unto you. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our church. Thank you for the many people here today. I pray, Lord, that this sermon would cause us to reflect on our life as a Christian. And Lord, we will not waste our life on vain things, on pleasure, on wealth. You know, Lord, even putting our family before you, I pray, Lord, that we would put you first in everything, that we would put the preaching of the gospel and winning souls at the forefront of everything we do, and we would see where everything else fits into fulfilling that purpose. Lord, get a hold of our hearts. Lord, help us not to just continue to live with a vain purpose. And I pray, Lord, that everything that we say and we do today is glorifying to you. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have this opportunity to be an ambassador. Give us your grace, Lord. Give us power. We want to be effective in your work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.